Well, good morning, everybody. And it's uh, it's been a while since we've had our Department of Health uh, briefing. Uh, I think there was a point where we were hoping we wouldn't have to have these briefings anymore, but obviously the situation continues to be concerning throughout the state of Washington. I wanna say good morning to all of you. Let me start before I get into COVID-19. I wanted to, to make a, a, a few comments about the situation in Afghanistan. I want to take a moment to reflect on what's going on in the ongoing crisis. I understand there's been a range of emotions that um, many have felt uh, by our nation's veterans, uh, our active military members, and the community at large. Uh, we know uh, how important our military community is in the state of Washington. We also know how important our immigrant refugee community is in the state of Washington. As this complicated issue continues to progress, we need to seek uh, grace uh, and give grace to each other and support each other, including the refugees that may be uh, coming into uh, the United States. Department of Health stands in solidarity with our Afghan and refugee community, our military, and offers our support to all involved. We know this is a very difficult situation, whether overseas or whether in transit, transition, or whether here locally. Uh, we also want to remind everybody if people are stressed about what they're hearing or seeing about this situation, we ask that they contact someone that they can talk to, uh, someone that they trust. And if, if that uh, is not possible, or in addition to that, if they're looking for professional help, please also remember there's a SAMHSA national helpline. This is the substance abuse, mental health, um, 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 help me guys, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Agency, National Helpline, SAMHSA Helpline, 1-800-662-HELP-4357. So I wanted to make sure to make that comment and make sure that everybody was aware of how important the situation is for all of us. Now let's turn to the pandemic. Um, I, wanna, I wanna say a few things. And, and I have colleagues here, including Dr. Mitchell, who's gonna be uh, describing what's happening in the healthcare system. We're particularly concerned about the, the increase uh, throughout our communities. This pandemic is not slowing down. Instead, if anything, it has sped up. In just a couple of months, Delta variant has ravaged our state. It has preyed particularly on those who are unvaccinated, those um, unvaccinated persons uh, unfortunately have largely driven our cases and our hospitalizations. Um, we know Delta is markedly more transmissible and that has led to what we are seeing across our communities, across Washington. I think the key message is that this pandemic rages on. Hospitals are absolutely stressed and strained largely due to the weight of the unvaccinated, but now we're also seeing additional persons that, that are uh, being admitted and or in the hospital and testing positive, even if they're asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. With respect to our hospitals and healthcare system, situation has certainly worsened statewide. And I'll use the three S's here. The system is stressed, it's stretched and strained. And the fourth S is we must support those very systems. Not only have COVID rate related care um, uh, been on top of what else has been happening in our healthcare system, either deferred care or people that are going there for another reason, like a heart attack or an injury. But staff shortages are a real concern, and that is something that's concerning to all of us. That means that staff beds and overall the system capacity is absolutely an issue, and we are concerned about that as well. So what does that mean? That means we all must do our part so things do not get worse. Um, we want to make sure that people are wearing their masks and getting vaccinated and avoiding situations such as crowded settings that may be of concern. If we can show the, the map of, of what's happening in our in, across Washington with hospitalizations, I'd like to show that now. So as you see this map, and this is on our, our website, uh, please refer to it. You're seeing that you've had a, a strain and increase across uh, the system, particularly that is um, in, in, the, 
in the setting of what's happening in our larger communities, but this is now also happening in our critical access hospitals in rural communities, smaller communities. Uh, we, the system is absolutely stretched. Like I said, it's stress stretched and strained, and that support means that people, all of us have to do our part to wear our masks, get vaccinated, and avoid crowded settings and situations that might uh, lead us to have COVID-19 on top of uh, everything else that's happening in our lives. We want to make sure the message is clear. This is not a time to defer care. If you have serious symptoms, you have chest pain, or if you're having numbness in your arm and you're not sure what it is, we still want you to contact your healthcare provider or still seek care in the hospital healthcare system. They are, yes, full, but they can still deliver care. Do not defer care. The system will determine the best course of treatment for you. We want to make sure people are still uh, seeking care that is necessary. This is also a reminder that we want people to stand by their friends and family in the healthcare field. We know a lot of our health professionals who have just done an incredible job across the state this entire 18 plus months. If you know someone that's doing that work, please tell them thank you. Uh, please get them some cookies or something <clears throat> to really make sure you show your gratitude. <clears throat> but I think um, <clears throat> it's really important, excuse me, it's really important <clears throat> to recognize the incredibly hard work that they're they're facing right now. But the best thing that you can do, the best way to help those who are serving all of us is to do your part, uh, to, to wear your mask, your face coverings, to get vaccinated, to be a champion of pro-health messages. We have seen a small increase in vaccinations recently, and Michelle Roberts is going to be speaking in general about vaccines, but we need to see more. We've had a 21% increase in vaccinations over the last week, a 34% increase over the last two weeks. That's great from a percentage standpoint. It still represents a small number overall from a quantity standpoint, and we want to make sure we see those numbers increase as best we can. If I can show the next slide, as, as you've heard us say over the last several briefings that we've had, that there is an incredible uh, uh, delta difference between what's happening in our healthcare system with those who are vaccinated versus those who are unvaccinated. About 95%, this 94.5% for those who want to be specific, 95% of COVID-19 cases from February 1st to August 3rd, uh, those who were hospitalized represented those who were not fully vaccinated. Again, 95% of COVID cases from February 1st to August 3rd who were hospitalized were not fully vaccinated. <clears throat> That means, and these are the graphs that we've shown before, that in, as you can see in the bottom graph, this is the age of 16 to 44, then top left is 45 to 64, and, and on the top right is 65 plus, that there is a seven-fold increased risk of hospitalization if you are unvaccinated, if you're 65 and above, 12 time increase 45 to 64 and a 13 time increase 16 to 44. I think what you should also note from these graphs is that you've seen an increase. You see that, that increase, that spike that you see on the very right, that we have seen an increase in hospitalizations, and that's something that we're all concerned about. We absolutely want to make sure everybody remembers vaccines mean protection. Please protect yourself and those around you. Please get vaccinated. This is the time to do that. Delta variant is the dominant strain statewide, and really it's representing now almost all of our cases throughout the state of Washington. Washington. So let me turn to how we are framing the steps that have been necessary in order to fight this pandemic. All of us know that Washington has done a fantastic job when it comes to vaccinations, when it comes to keeping our hospitalizations and our death rates uh, lower than other states and other communities across the country. We have done an amazing job, and that's thanks to all of our Washingtonian partners and Washingtonians themselves. This is a difficult but, but important time for all of us, and difficult times require decisive action, which absolutely, as we know, Governor Inslee and others have taken over the last few weeks. 
anything we can do to increase vaccinations, whether that means requirements or incentives, are key to protecting our communities and now, as you can see, our healthcare system and ultimately Washingtonians. We know vaccines work. They are safe, they're effective, and they are available everywhere in our state. This week's announcement of full approval of the Pfizer vaccine by FDA, which Michelle will talk about, was an incredibly important step forward. And for those who are waiting for that full approval, and once the CDC's ACIP committee gets together and reviews that on August 30th, we should get that approval. And when that occurs, that will be another barrier that's removed for individuals who are waiting for that. As I said, we have seen a small increase in vaccinations recently, but we need to see more. We also know in addition to vaccines working, that masks and face coverings work. They add another necessary protective layer that will be key for everyone today. As you know, the secretary's order for masks went into effect on Monday. It will be key for our kids going back to school and they're key for all of us, especially in indoor settings and crowded settings outdoors. I'm gonna also remind everybody to avoid crowded situations, especially if you are uncertain about the vaccination status of those around you. That is what we want everybody to keep in mind, that all those messages about hand washing and making sure that you're keeping your distance, all of those other messages are absolutely critical now, but the most important messages are wear your mask and get vaccinated. We need people to follow these precautions in order to right the ship and slow the spread and help our healthcare system that right now is quite stretched. We have done this before, and now I'm asking you, I'm urging you to reach deep inside and do it again. Our collective health depends on it. And I wanna thank you, all of our Washingtonians for what you have done, especially those <clears throat> who have been vaccinated and who are wearing their masks <clears throat> and doing the right things. But I absolutely want to thank all Washingtonians because this has been a very difficult time for everyone involved. So let me now turn it over to Michelle Roberts. She's going to be talking about vaccines. After that, we're gonna have Dr. Lindquist uh, talk about more in the data. And then Dr. Mitchell's gonna talk more about what the healthcare system is seeing. And then we'll end with Lacey Fahrenbach who's gonna talk about back to school safety and other related information. So with that, thank you so much. And Michelle, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, Dr. Shaw, and good morning, everybody. I'm Michelle Roberts, and I lead the state's COVID-19 vaccine planning and distribution team. I wanna start by thanking the more than 4.7 million people who received at least their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, you are doing your part and you're protecting yourself, your family, and your community. I'm happy to share that rates are rising. And while that's great news, like Dr. Shaw, um, Shaw said, to see this increase over the last couple of weeks, we still have a ways to go. 1.9 million eligible people haven't gotten their first dose of vaccine yet. With COVID cases, hospitalizations, and the highly transmittable Delta variant, it's more important than ever that you get vaccinated. This week, we re reached a significant vaccine milestone. The FDA granted full approval to the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for everyone age 16 and older. While we already knew that vaccine was safe and effective, this is further proof, and it should boost people's confidence that the vaccine works. Next week, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and the Western State Scientific Safety Review Group are scheduled to meet, um, to, meet to discuss their recommendations. We'll share more at that time. Recently, the FDA um, announced booster shots for Pfizer and Moderna could be available as soon as this fall, if authorized by the FDA and recommended by the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. The federal government has assured us supply is sufficient. If our federal partners and the Western States Work Group recommend boosters, then we'll make sure they're available for people in Washington. Right now, the best signs are that, and we're being told that people could be eligible eight months after they receive their second dose. I wanna stress that this does not mean the vaccine is ineffective. We know it works. It's doing a great job of preventing severe illness, hospitalization, and death, even against the Delta variant. But now with variants, there is some reduced protection against mild illness, which is why plans are being developed for booster doses. In addition to boosters, 
third doses of Pfizer and Moderna are now available for certain people who are immunocompromised. Again, the vaccines are highly effective, but data suggests people with moderately to severely compromised immune systems do not always build the same level of immunity after they get COVID vaccines. A third dose can provide those who need it extra protection. Science continues to show vaccines are the best tool we have to protect our communities and slow the spread of COVID-19. Let's encourage our friends and family to get vaccinated today. If anyone has questions, visit the department's frequently asked questions page or reach out and talk to a trusted healthcare provider about the vaccine. Making an appointment is easy. You can visit, visit our vaccine locator website, text your zip code to get vax, which is 438829, or call the COVID-19 hotline at 833-VAX-HELP. Together, by making sure all of our population is vaccinated who's eligible, we can help in the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Roberts. Next, we'll go to Chief Science Officer Scott Lindquist. Hi, good morning, everyone. Just want to give us a snapshot of where we're at. Um, our case counts are as high as they've ever been in the state of Washington. We've had a very steep increase in the number of cases. Um, that is also mirrored, usually lags about one to two weeks behind the case count, but our hospitalization counts have also risen. The, the good news in this is in some of the incomplete data, we're seeing a stalling or a flattening of our rise in cases. So that's very promising. Not not sure if that's going to hold over the next week or so. So we'll we'll certainly update you guys next week as we see this data. But it's very promising to see a pause in the rapid rise in cases. The hospitalizations, as Dr. Shaw said earlier, have not shown any signs of slowing and are actually quite overwhelming for the state of Washington right now. But the good news is our death rates even despite the increased cases, increased hospitalizations have remained fairly stable here in Washington state. Um, we'll watch that carefully, but it really goes to the fact that the predominance of the Delta variant, where over 96% of all our isolates coming into the state right now, and again, reminder, we do about 20% of all our samples that are positive, we're, we're genotyping to keep an eye on what variants are around. And over 96% being the Delta variant um, has shown us that while the death rate remains low, the case counts and the hospitalizations are increasing. It's not more severe, it's just much more infectious. So we're seeing a lot more infectiousness um, with this Delta variant. And the last thing is really watching our breakthrough cases. We're concerned about uh, um, the breakthrough cases. We've been within the range of normal. Uh, again, we modeled this with the CDC very early. Um, we are looking at better ways to look at, as people have pointed out, um, are we capturing all breakthroughs? And the answer to that is probably not. So we are looking at better ways to um, actually measure our breakthroughs, but there has not been um, a significant um, change this week uh, in our cases and our breakthroughs. We are having increased numbers, but um, more to come on that as, we, as we're as um, we getting better at getting on top of those numbers. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Frangi. Thank you, Dr. Lindquist. Next, we'll go to... Uh, Pardon me. Next, we'll go to Director Steve Mitchell. Hi, uh, Steve Mitchell. I'm the uh, medical director of the Washington Medical Coordination Center, uh, which has been working closely with the Department of Health to help distribute patients throughout the state of Washington and, and, uh, and uh, deal with the uh, COVID surge that we're experiencing with Delta. And I'm also the emergency department medical director at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. And so hospitals throughout our state, as has been said, are full and at the highest levels of occupancy that our state have ever seen. Our hospitals in particular that provided advanced care where patients are transferred to, all of them are stretched and stressed and stretching their staffs in ways that we have never asked them to, to stretch before. And this means that for uh, many, many patients, 
for long periods of time, they are waiting in emergency departments before getting a bed in the hospitals, especially in the, uh, the community hospitals and regional hospitals that accept transfer patients. There are even patients now that are experiencing their entire hospital stay while still located in the emergency department. And this also leads to ambulances having to wait for longer periods of time before they can unload their patients into the emergency departments. And so those ambulances are not available to serve the public. And, and that forces the regional hospitals that normally accept these patients uh, from small and critical access in rural facilities in our state. It's because of the load of patients in those, in those uh, regional hospitals, they're having to deal with those, uh, those patients that are arriving in their emergency departments who are acutely ill, rather than focusing on bringing those transfer patients in from those smaller facilities. And so that is further straining the situation. And so that in turn is, is severely really impacting our small and critical access, our rural facilities. Because the entire health system is built on providing care in the small hospitals for more minor issues, and, and they are meant to stabilize patients. And then for more critical illnesses, uh, they are meant to transfer those patients to larger facilities that have the staff and the equipment and the specialists who can care for those, uh, those acute illnesses. But sadly, for large periods of time now, we have reached a point where there are actually no critical care beds that are able to accept those, those patients throughout our entire state, as well as acute care beds available to serve those patients who need to be transferred. Put another way, there are long periods of time where we are just unable to, to move patients around our state to get access to the care that they need. Um, a few examples of this, of this have, occur, have occurred in the past few days. There was a patient, for instance, who came into a, uh, into a hospital on the Washington coast with severe COVID illness and had to be emergently put onto a ventilator in order to save his life. And there was no ICU bed anywhere that our team could locate anywhere in the entire state of Washington. And it was actually a, a, a hospital in Idaho that was able to accept that patient after many hours of trying. And that's where the patient was, was transported to. There was another case of a, of a, of a uh, of a lady who arrived at a very small critical access hospital on the eastern side of our state, whose prognosis was dire. However, our team at the Washington Medical Coordination Center tried for over eight hours to find an ICU bed for this lady, um, um, this patient who was severely ill. And unfortunately, she actually did pass away in this small hospital when after eight hours of trying, we were unable to find uh, uh, an ICU bed that could help sustain her life at that point. And in the past several days, there was another example of a, of a gentleman who was on the far Eastern side of our state who needed a, who had an overwhelming infection and needed emergent surgery in order to deal with that infection. And, and uh, it took over six hours uh, before we were even able to locate the, a, a bed for this patient, a hospital that could, could take him for emergency surgery and, uh, and then we still had to move him from the far eastern side of the state over into western Washington so he could have his emergency surgery to hopefully save his life. And so this is occurring in our, because every hospital in our state is short on staff, as has been said. Um, we're talking about nurses and respiratory therapists and, and janitorial staff, really the lifeblood of our hospitals. And, and then although many, many of our hospitals are short on beds, that staffing is really the critical aspect that is challenging everybody. And what's particularly difficult is that the number of COVID patients in our hospitals is doubling. But right now, as Dr. Linkless, Linkless implied, about every 18 or 19 days and 95% of those patients are not vaccinated. We are at 1,462 patients right now in our hospitals who have confirmed COVID cases. And that's an all time high for our state. And so put another way, uh, that is we've added an additional 1,100 patients to our state hospitals just in the past 30 days. And so for reference, that's an equivalent of four Cadillac medical centers in Tri-Cities or five Confluence health, health hospitals in Wenatchee or five 
Yakima Memorial Hospitals in Yakima on the eastern side of our state that have been significantly impacted or three St. Peter's, Providence St. Peter's Hospitals in Olympia or uh, where I work clinically, Harborview Medical Center, it's equivalent to two Harborview Medical Centers. And so we, I can't implore people strong enough for the need to get vaccinated and to do all the safety measures that are needed because our hospitals and our health system are under more strain right now than we have ever been before. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. And next we'll go to Deputy Secretary Lacey Fehrenbach. Good morning, everyone. Um, want to talk about back to school and certainly acknowledge um, Given what you've heard today, it's not surprising that many families are looking at what we face with Delta and wondering, you know, is it even possible to go back to school uh, in the coming weeks? I understand and completely empathize with this. I look at these disease and hospitalization numbers every day, watching them climb as we approach the school year. I do this as part of my job, but I also do it as the parent of two children who will start school, kindergarten and fifth grade in September. My children are too young to be vaccinated and our family has been super cautious to protect them you know, throughout this past year and a half. While our disease levels are very concerning, as you've heard from my colleagues here today, I am sending my kids back to school in a couple of weeks and I wanted to share why uh, for all those parents out there that have questions about this. Um, the first thing is that schools are fundamental to our children's growth, learning, development, and well-being. Uh, in addition to an education, they get many health and social benefits being uh, in person, at a school building, with their friends, and in that supportive environment. And, you know, there is clear um, science that our children have studied, uh, struggled academically and emotionally during the pandemic, and most health and education experts agree that in-person instruction remains a priority for the year ahead. My kids are very excited about um, being able to return and see their friends and their teachers and have that structure uh, back in their lives and schedules. We also know how to do this as safely as possible. Uh, the science has given us information there as have um, our own experience and our state has required layered prevention measures for schools. And these balance the need to maximize in-person instruction and minimize risk of transmission. This starts with vaccines that as you've heard is our most protective measure and the best tool we have in the pandemic. Um, most school staff are already vaccinated, but uh, under governor's proclamation, all K-12 staff must be vaccinated by October 18th. This is hugely protective for our children and all staff who work in schools. We also strongly recommend that all students 12 and older get vaccinated. If you have an adolescent in your house that isn't vaccinated, now is the time. They'll be protected from COVID, able to engage in their favorite after school activities and social things, and also unlikely to have to quarantine if exposed to COVID-19. If you have questions about the vaccine um, and if your child should take it, please contact your child's healthcare provider um, and, and be ready to ask your questions and let them hear your concerns. The um, second best tool we have are face coverings and the science is clear that they help to limit transmission in schools when consistently and correctly worn. All students and staff are required to wear face coverings and masks indoors um, in private and public schools across the state. Uh, a lot of parents have reached out and asked, what is the best face covering? What do you recommend? Uh, so the most important thing is that you choose a mask that fits your child snugly and covers their nose and mouth completely you know, and wraps around the side of their face. Uh, multiple layers of tightly woven fabric are um, best. Uh, you can consider a, like a surgical mask or a KN95 mask, but ultimately the best mask is the one that your kids will wear all day. 
um, pack them an extra one or two every day in their backpack and start working with them now to get used to wearing masks if they um, are new, uh, new to the school environment like my kindergartner or if they have not been wearing a mask a lot because they've been home for the summer. We also have additional required measures like improved ventilation, physical distancing, hand washing, cleaning, disinfecting, and then you know keeping our kids or staying home sick, staying home when we are sick. Schools and families have to also be prepared to respond to COVID-19 cases when they happen. And um, that includes testing, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. My children's school district is one of more than 200 across our state that are participating in the state's Learn to Return testing program. Um, and that is you know, an extraordinary resource to make testing quickly available when there are cases um, or your child is ex potentially exposed to COVID-19 at school. Again, a reminder, all schools in Washington State public and, public and private are required to use these layered measures. Each one of them provides a layer of protection, but when you put them together, they help limit the spread of COVID-19 among children and school staff. Across our state, our schools and our children did an excellent job last year at using these measures. When transmission happened in the schools, outbreaks were very small, usually only two to three cases in total. This gives us confidence that we can do this again. My third reason is that there are actions each and every one of us can take now to start the school year as safely as possible um, for our children. And this all boils down to lower, lowering the amount of disease circulating around the surrounding community. Doing this reduces the risk of COVID-19 being introduced to the school environment in the first place. And each and every one of us has a role to play. Parents, caregivers, grandparents, aunties, uncles, neighbors, friends. The very best way we can protect our students, especially children who cannot yet be vaccinated, is to get vaccinated ourselves and help those who are eligible to do so. The higher the vaccination rate is in your community, the more likely your schools will be able to remain open for, for full-time in-person instruction without interruptions this fall and through the school year. Similarly, as Dr. Shaw mentioned, wear masks when indoors or in crowded outdoor settings. Watch your distance, wash your hands, and use WA Notify. These are tools that have helped us for the past year and a half, um, and they can help us turn this fifth wave around. If, like me, you have children who can't be vaccinated, choose lower risk activities to keep them safer. Keep your social circles small, take any play dates, sports, arts, family activities outside, and limit travel and avoid crowds, as Dr. Shaw said. The last thing I want to say is that. This pandemic has been hugely impactful to every person in Washington state and every family in some way has been touched. Parents have shouldered a tremendous burden supporting your children all these months in uh, distance or hybrid learning. It has been bumpy, exhausting and stressful. We know you're tired. We know you're craving normalcy for yourselves and your children. And given the ups and downs in the recent couple of months, you may feel anxiety, frustration, anger, even sadness. It is okay to feel these things and it's okay to ask for help. Please write this number down, 1-833-681-0211. That is the number for Washington listeners. If you need someone to talk to about stress due to COVID-19, now or in the future, call to get connected to resources and support. Again, 833-681-0211. I want to close on a hopeful note. We face a more transmissible variant, but we also have more tools in our toolbox than we did this time last year, like vaccines and expanded testing. We also know how to limit transmission in schools, and this is informed by our own experience in Washington State, the experiences of schools across the nation and globe, um, and the science. We know the tools to curb COVID, even the formidable de Delta variant in our communities. It depends on all of us and it will take all of us doing our part. We have to dig deep as Dr. Shaw said, but we can and we must do everything to keep our students healthy and our schools open. Back to you. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Fehrenbach.
This brings us to the Q&A segment of today's briefing. We do have several media with questions today. If we're not able to get to your question, please reach out to us at doh-pio at doh.wa.gov. Our first question today comes from Ariel with the spokesman. Frangie, I don't hear anything. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I was just checking in the Zoom here. Um, Ariella, can you go ahead? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, go yes. ahead. Sorry, my computer froze. Um, two questions. Are we seeing excess deaths that are non-COVID related due to the current surge in COVID hospitalizations? And if so, how many? And secondly, do we have any sort of forecast or modeling that shows how sustained the surge of hospitalizations will last given the new mask mandate. Thank you. Well, let me uh, <clears throat> let me make uh, take a, um, uh, a general stab at that uh, at that question that second question, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Linquist and Dr. Mitchell if they want to add anything on on uh, excess death, um, including hospitalizations. Um, I think the key message that we've got is that look the the reason that the governor and all of us have taken decisive action at the state level over the last few weeks, including both vaccine requirements, but also masking requirements is because we do not want to see a sustained uh, surge. Um, the truth of the matter is we do not know exactly uh, how uh, important the masking requirements are to slowing things down from a standpoint of, of adherence. Really, we can put requirements in place, but it's really up to the community and the public to follow those requirements. And so this is why all of us, our message is that things are bad in the system right now. Our healthcare system is absolutely stretched and, and stressed and strained. And what we're asking everybody to do is to reach deep and do this once again. And so it, we are also very mindful of the fact that vaccines take longer to work uh, to see a response, and that can be several weeks, uh, if not longer. But we know that masks work immediately. They, they provide that added layer of protection. So we're hopeful that with the mask requirements, which by the way, started as you know, Monday, however, the announcement was a week prior to that. So we already know you know, as you anecdotally were in food establishments or restaurants or, or grocery stores, people were already starting to wear masks more so even prior to the requirement going into place. And that's exactly what we want to see. And we're, we're actually hopeful that that is going to help slow down this current surge that we have. Uh, in addition to that, it's, it's all the other precautions that we've referred to. So with that, let me turn it to Scott and Steve, if you wanted to add anything to for additional questions. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Sure, uh, that's a great question. And um, we know that, I cannot give you an exact number on on the excess number of deaths that are uh, non-COVID related, but I can tell you that, uh, for instance, in the hospital where I work, which is Harborview Medical Center, we're a level one trauma center, and we are seeing more patients arriving with severe trauma than at any time in the past five years, for instance. Our data only goes back five years, the data uh, pool that I was looking at. And so, and I do think there, there are certainly cases that, um, as I mentioned in my comments, that lead to delayed, significantly delayed care because of how full our, our hospitals are and their long periods of time when we are not able to access the, the locations and the hospital beds that can care for them. And so that for time critical illnesses, such as I mentioned, that means sometimes a difference between life and death. And so it is hard to measure, but I do believe that there is increased mortality that is resulting from, uh, from what is going on in the hospitals. And Ariel, the, the last thing I'll add is, um, this is a great question. We work with a, a quite a few modelers at the state. And one of the questions I asked our modelers two days ago was, please give me a projection of the hospital admissions over the next two weeks. And so they, they are working on that and have told me on Thursday that they'll have that available. We can share that when we've had a chance to vet it here at the, at the state. 
All right, our next question comes from Steve with Kobo. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, taking my questions. I have two for you today. Um, one is, is that Oregon's governor announced a statewide outdoor mask mandate yesterday. And I guess the question becomes, uh, since we're so close to them, is that something that's coming for Washington next? Have there been any discussions within DOH about implementing something similar here? And the second question is, what is the state's plan to relieve the current stress on the state's hospital system? While I appreciate the message, uh, telling people to mask up and get vaccinated only goes so far, and we've seen that over this pandemic. So what is the plan to make sure that hospitals don't go into crisis mode, like what we've seen in, in severe circumstances in other states? Are we talking about mobile hospitals? Is there anything that can be done with staffing challenges, drop teams, that sort of thing? I'd be curious to hear what, what the state's plan is regarding that challenge. Steve, thanks for that. Uh, those both of those questions. The first, uh, let me let me take a, a crack at both of those, and then I'll turn it over to uh, to Lacey, Scott, Steve, and also I, I was remiss to to mention that Andy Rose is also on, who uh, leads our COVID operations, um, um, and and I think we'll be able to provide some operational um, insights as well. Um, as far as um, additional steps that we may take. Uh, you know, we've made it very clear that we're willing to take whatever steps are necessary in order to protect Washington and our communities. And the 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 real important piece of this is as we're watching what's happening with the mask requirements and the and the following of those mask requirements that were just put in place on Monday. Uh, we've already made the recommendation that if you're in outdoor settings, especially crowded outdoor settings, also consider or I'd strongly recommend or encourage or incentivize, do whatever word you want to use to wear a mask as well. That does not mean that you have to wear it all the time, uh, but if you feel more comfortable and you want to be safer, you can wear it as much as you can, and that is absolutely what's in in place. We are looking at, and we've had discussions about additional uh, steps that we may need to take with, alongside the governor's office and other partners at the state state level. And I will tell you that right now we are watching the, the concerns that we have, not just with cases across the state, but especially the case, the, the hospitalizations and the, the situation across the healthcare system. And so right, while we have not taken those additional steps, yes, we have discussed, are there additional steps that we may need to take in order to curb this, this current wave? So uh, to answer that first question, on the second question, uh, the state has actually taken quite a bit of steps. And the reason that, that Dr. Mitchell is here is that we are actually hand in hand working closely with not just him, but a number of partners across our healthcare system. And I, I particularly want to thank uh, our healthcare providers and partners, uh, whether it's the medical association, the hospital association, uh, whether it's the healthcare authority, uh, there are a number of partners across at the state or the association level that we have been working with. And really uh, what we have done is one said that we are there to support you. So what you need, we are working towards trying to help with. That means that we're working to um, help expedite some of the discharges that um, have not uh, been possible because of placement issues in the hospitals currently, whether it's for COVID or beyond. Uh, we're also um, absolutely concerned about the staffing, which uh, Dr. Mitchell has underscored. And that is something that I, 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 I think it's important to, to paint this national picture. Uh, this is not one of those situations where we can just uh, you know, kind of snap our fingers and say, hey, federal government, please send us resources for staffing. Unfortunately, the staffing for the entire country when it comes to clinical staff uh, is tight. It's it's stretched. And this is happening not just in Washington, but across the entirety of the country. And so we have, um, and, and this is where Andy comes in, we have looked at uh, ways that we can ask for additional resources. We're also encouraging hospitals uh, from an elective procedure standpoint uh, to curtail any of those elective procedures that are not necessary. Obviously, that uh, does not mean that we, we do know with 18 months of delayed care, there are some procedures that are important. Uh, at the same time, we're also encouraging um, inter in inter-system um, transfer of patients and resources, and that's also happening. So a number of steps that are happening behind the scenes, uh, and, and I I think you use the word crisis. So let me just say, we want to do everything we can to avoid that we get into a, 
a crisis situation that is so bad that we now have to curtail the um, uh, ability to provide care in that very healthcare system. And so all these steps are really incumbent on all of us to take, but also what we're doing at the state to work with our healthcare partners so that we are taking the steps um, in order to avoid that kind of a scenario. So let me let me kick it off uh, to anybody who on our team wants to take it, because I think there, there are a number of uh, ways to, this is a really important question Question. So I want to make sure that we we do get this from a number of different angles. Yeah, I can chime in real quick. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. I, I think it's important to understand we we are every day turning over every stone, exploring every avenue we can to try to find the staff that we we need to to support our healthcare and hospital systems. I think it's important to key on on something Dr. Mitchell mentioned earlier. And that's really about the staff we're talking about. We're talking about everybody that keeps the lights on and the doors open in a hospital or healthcare setting. That's janitorial services, facility services, and our clinical staff. All have been battling for 20 months, working enormous amounts of hours, seven days a week, to protect our Washingtonians and everybody across this nation in this pandemic. And it's been tough. So we are really striving to support those currently still working in these systems, lift them up, let them know what type of heroes they really are, and support them to continue this effort in these settings while we explore what else we can do to support them. I'll just add that uh, in addition to um, what has already been mentioned, we are, um, we are, <laughs> You know, turning over every rock and looking in every corner to be able to uh, access appropriate beds for people and, and staff for people who really need the care. And so we are doing things like um, many of our hospitals in our state are working with uh, 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 and the smaller facilities are working with telehealth to be able to bring experts to the bedside, even if they cannot be physically located, then they can come in by video and help those very small hospitals who are not used to taking for taking care of critically ill patients, help them uh, meet the demands of what is occurring in, in, in front of them. And we are, as Dr. Shah had said, um, all of our hospitals are can canceling non-urgent surgeries in order to meet the demand and to, to free up the space and the staff, particularly the staff, to be able to, to, be, to be able to help, and then um, and also it's an important issue too. Is there, um, as as has been mentioned, uh, there are shortages are throughout the entire healthcare continuum. So, patients who are in our long term care facilities, places like adult family homes and such, they are also um, under significant strain. And so we are working with them, uh, with the great help of the of the Department of Health, to get those patients out of our hospitals who no longer need hospital care, but still are not well enough to say go home, for instance. And so we are working really hard to transition those patients. And that's incredibly important also because that frees up the space and the staff in our hospitals. And, and so really, truly, every we are trying to think creatively in every, every day and every way that we possibly can in order to meet the demand. Um, but uh, some of the options we've historically been able to rely on, such as the federal government or even, even moving patients from highly impacted areas to less impacted areas, um, those op options are really strained right now because of how widespread um, this, this challenge is. The states of Idaho, the states of Montana, the states of Oregon, California are all significantly impacted, as are we. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jessamine with Q13. Good morning and thank you all for your time. Um, sorry that we're speaking again under these circumstances. I have a question about the staffing. Um, I'm wondering if there are certain situations or have you already been in contact with non-hospital settings such as orthopedic centers and um, dental offices, anything of that sort that could help you with staffing or even facility management. And, and Dr. Mitchell, I, I guess that is directed towards you, but um, is the state even considering that, Dr. Shaw? 
You know, let me just say really quickly, and then I'll, I'll kick it over to Dr. Mitchell. I, I would say that, you know, we, we, we've already had some offers from uh, various entities who have said, hey, what can we do to help? And wherever we can plug them in and help the, with their assistance, uh, get their assistance, we have done that. Obviously, there are some limitations to what we can do, and we want to make sure that patient care remains safe, uh, that it's accessible, and that we do not impact those other activities as well. So we're doing everything we can from our standpoint. Uh, but I do think that you bring up a really good point that this is not a time where we have um, needed to. And I think the previous question was also about, you know, whether we have um, uh, the need for alternate care sites or other areas to to open up. Uh, this is not that kind of a situation yet. Again, we want to avoid getting there. And that's why it's incumbent on all of us to do the things that we need to do and then also to support our healthcare system. So with that, Dr. Mitchell, anything you wanted to add? No, I would just say that I uh, uh, completely agree. And uh, there are regions in our state that are that have um, uh, closed down outpatient facilities, outpatient surgery centers, for instance, to be able to liberate those staff to come work in the hospitals. And, and we have to be very, very careful because, um, because taking, doing patient care in one area is not the same as doing patient care in another area. And so oftentimes those additional staff, which are needed, are brought alongside to sort of extend nurses oftentimes who are working in the hospitals to make them more efficient and provide the care they are needed. But those sorts of situations have been occurring all over our state. All right, our next question comes from Essex with Cairo. Yes, hello, good morning, good morning. Uh, I've been hearing from people who have been receiving text messages on their cell phones promoting the vaccines. Are these text messages targeted to those who are unvaccinated? And how is medical privacy being protected? Thanks, Essex. I think Michelle, uh, fortunately, just joined right as, uh, right as you asked the question. She rejoined uh, our briefing. Uh, and so, Michelle, maybe you can, you can help answer that. Yeah, Essex, those text messages could be coming from a lot of different places. They could be coming from your healthcare provider um, who is, um, we're working with our healthcare providers and asking them to review records of their patients and seeing who's been vaccinated and not vaccinated and reaching out. The state has also been using data in our immunization information system to follow up with people who may be missing their second dose or haven't been vaccinated yet. So um, there is outreach happening that is is protected. We're using it for a public health purpose, which is in um, within a healthcare provider's authority and within the department's authority. And it really is just reminding people um, about the most important thing we can do to stop the pandemic, which is get vaccinated. All right. Our next question comes from Jake with King Five. Hi all, thanks for bringing the, brief, the briefing back. We appreciate it. Um, one question that uh, we've heard from a few folks this week is about herd immunity. Obviously rising cases is never good, but does this contribute at all to the herd immunity of the population and an inevitable flattening of the curve? Also a quick second question, the vaccination rate among children still remains low. Uh, how concerning is that? And are you seeing an uptick in vaccinations among that age group? Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Jake. And uh, we were hoping we didn't have to bring this back. So, you know, unfortunately, here we are. Um, as far as herd immunity, I think the, the, the best way to say this is that we, we would uh, very much uh, believe that the right way to get to um, adequate vaccine coverage or adequate coverage of protection, which is the way I like to phrase it, is not to get people sick and infected, but to get them vaccinated and protected. So I think that is the key message here. And so, uh, you know, whatever we can do, obviously, to increase our vaccine coverage rates, that's what we're attempting to do. And I think it's also important to say that, look, across the state of Washington, we've been incredibly successful, but that 70 plus percent that we have had vaccinated across the state from a statewide standpoint does not mean that there are not counties where you have an incredible difference between other counties or communities or neighborhoods within communities within those counties that you also have uh, an incredible amount of uh, 
uh, decreases or uh, differences in the vaccine coverage rate. If we had a 70 plus percent across the entirety of the state, every neighborhood, every community, every county, every region, we would be in a different place. Unfortunately, what we have is that you have pockets where you have incredibly high vaccination rates, sometimes as, as well over 90%, and other places that you have it in the 30% uh, percent range, and that is what concerns all of us. So, uh, Scott, did you have anything you wanted to add to, to, that, uh, to that piece? Um, the only thing that I would add is that we do track our modelers look at both vaccine immunity and then immunity from disease and do some projections. And it still remains below what is necessary to interrupt this uh, transmission of COVID in the state, especially with a more infectious agent like Delta. And let's be honest, um, we know that um, it, 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 even though, as Michelle said, we have so many millions of people across Washington who have, have gotten their vaccines, there's still uh, a, a significant portion of our population that's either has not gotten vaccinated or is ineligible, like kids, unable to get vaccinated. And so that means that this pandemic rages on, uh, even as we're attempting to do everything we can to, to stop it. Unfortunately, this pandemic rages on. Why? Because we still have enough, you know, enough uh, uh, people out there who are unexposed, unvaccinated, and unfortunately unprotected. And that's what's happening right now. And that's why our healthcare system is is stretched so thin. Uh, you had? Did you have a second question? I can't remember. Um, we we're so focused on your first question. I want to make sure you. You're, did you have a second question? One minute, Dr. Shaw. I'm going to. Need to I'll control the Zoom mute here. Hold on. Go ahead, Jake. Unmuted again. So special. Uh, yes, my second uh, second question was about the children. The the, the, the vaccination rate among children um, still remains low. How concerning is that? And are you seeing an uptick um, in, in that vaccination rate among that age group? Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah, we are seeing an uptick of vaccinations among all age groups. Um, I believe, though, it is the, the bigger uptakes are, are happening among older adults. So there still is a gap among our children. Um, the dashboard will update later today, but as of the data that was posted on Monday, about 48% of our 12 to 15 year olds have initiated vaccination in our state and 54% of our 16 to 17 year olds. So that's good. That's about half of the kids who are eligible in our state have started. We would love to see those numbers climb, especially with school getting started. So we're really encouraging parents to talk with their healthcare providers. Many parents maybe need to check their um, vaccine status for their kids for vac other vaccines that are required for school, or maybe they're going in for sports physical or other things with their children. So it is really the right time to be talking to your healthcare provider about vaccination for your um, 12 to 17 year olds if you have not started yet. And I will know that all of our pediatricians and um, other providers across the state who are serving our kids are ready and want to make sure all those kids are best protected before they start school. And the way to do that is to get them vaccinated. All right. Our, our next question comes from Nicole with Cairo Radio. Um, real quick, Frangie, I, I, before Nicole speaks, I, I just wanted to make one comment to what Michelle said. We are also, we would encourage our schools and our school districts and, and any of our educators, if they have an, any opportunity to, to work in partnership with their healthcare system or to even hold events in their own campus, to please do that. Even if you, you get kids started now, uh, that gets them partially protected uh, before the school year has, has started or as it starts. And then and certainly they can get the second dose as they get uh, further into the school year. But we would encourage our schools and our educators, and they've just done such an amazing job this entire pandemic. And we know asking them to do even more is hard right now, but this is also where if they can help us and help our public health system, our healthcare system to get kids vaccinated, this is the time to do that. So back to school means backpacks and school supplies. It also means this, this time also, kids who are eligible to get them vaccinated. So I wanted to make sure to, to bring that up as well. 
So Nicole, with your question, sorry about that. No problem. And mine is on the same line as, as children. So it's quite fitting. We heard that there was a child who died of COVID at Children's Hospital yesterday and that there were quite a few others in the ICU there. Can you confirm this? And can you describe the situation right now with kids in the ICU, especially in Seattle? I, I can't confirm that one, but Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Linquist, maybe maybe you can. I mean, I think in general, uh, what I would say is that we're we're obviously this is the concern that we have is that you know a lot of a lot of uh, parents have have uh, unfortunately taken the the stance that look kids are not uh, necessary to. Uh, to protect because they are not at risk and they are at risk. And uh, there is also uh, what I just talked about with vaccines that they're at least for 16 and plus, uh, they're, they're able to get protected. Uh, and that we're obviously when, when we haven't even seen school start yet uh, and we were already put in school requirements for vaccinations, but also for kids K through 12 to be masked. I mean, that's absolutely critical as well. And what the, the strategies, the, the layering strategies that Lacey mentioned earlier, these are all in effect. But this is what we're trying to avoid is to have situations where uh, all of us as parents or adults, we do not want to see kids impacted, especially when when oftentimes they have no choice but to uh, be driven by what's happening by either parents, adults or what's happening in the community when it comes to our transmission rate. So with that, Dr. Mitchell or Dr. Lindquist. Dr. Linkless, yeah, um, I, go ahead. Go ahead yeah, I was going to say yes. I I did learn of a of a pediatric death yesterday. Um, the details are not something we usually talk about. Um, and to be honest, uh, I don't have the details uh, beyond the age of this person. And so it's a zero to nineteen year old. Um, and it, in fact, uh, these are very disappointing. Um, at a time when we have both masks and vaccines, this is a preventable death. And I would just add, uh, um, I was not familiar with uh, that particular situation, but I know our colleagues who are working in the children's hospitals, um, they, are, they share the exact same concerns that I've been trying to articulate. Um, uh, some of the hospitals that take care of both adults and children have had to even uh, dedicate a higher portion of their hospital beds to adults than they normally would. And so as uh, the number of children are impacted um, and have to be hospitalized, it's, this, is, this too is adding further strain. And I know our colleagues at Seattle Children's Hospital, for instance, although they're not quite as, as high in terms of the occupancy as some of our, as all of our adult hospitals, they are very uncomfortably high and straining and doing all the necessary steps to be able to stretch their staff and, ex and, and extend their ability to care because they are quite concerned um, uh, as, we, as we deal with this Delta variant. I can just quickly add, you know, the, the trends that we're seeing in epidemiology in terms of increasing cases and increasing hospitalizations, those are increasing among all age groups, including among children. And, you know, the really hard thing is with, you know, the situation we have, this, this is largely driven um, by people who are unvaccinated. And as you've heard many of us say, you know, all people in Washington 11 and under cannot yet be vaccinated. So they're at increased risk just by virtue of their age. Uh, and when you see more cases, you see more hospitalization. So um, we have, we do have rising numbers of kids in the hospital right now because of the level of disease. Tranji, how many uh, reporters do we have left? We want to uh, try to wrap up in just the next several minutes here. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, we're able to take one more reporter if you're able to as well. Sure. All right. Our last question comes from Hannah with Q13. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking the question. Um, two quick questions here. So I do want to follow up on what Essis has asked because I wanted some clarification on Michelle's answer. So are you confirming that the Washington Department of Health is working with, you know, other agencies and medical personnel to specifically reach out to the unvaccinated and asking them to get vaccinated via these texts or messages? And then the second question I had was, um, you know, Roughly 30% are unvaccinated right now in the state. And a common thing we hear from these people 
is that they, the, the government doesn't have the power to tell them to put something in their body and they feel that it is their right. So how do you reach that group of people that are strong in their convictions? What do we do differently or say to them at this point that hasn't convinced them already? Thank you. Yeah, I can take that one and um, others can jump in, but let me start by talking a little bit more about the text messages. So really want to first start with saying that DOH does not share people's personal information, including phone numbers with outside groups. The text message you mentioned or Essex mentioned could be one sent by the department. I also said that we know our healthcare providers um, are also reaching out to their patients, but um, the text messages that the department is involved with are second dose reminders. So Washington's immunization information system indicates who is overdue for their second dose using the contact information the person provided when they received their first dose. The message, the message does not name the person, but instead says, Someone at this number or email may be overdue for their second dose. We also um, have some text messages going out for upcoming vaccination events. These are not person specific, so we're not sharing any personally identifiable information, but when our caravans or other community vaccination events are, we have partnered with a third party text service that has proprietary access to phone numbers. So through this, people are notified via text that there's an upcoming COVID-19 vaccine event near them. So they're just generically going out to people who may be within the catchment area for where an upcoming vaccine event. It's not personally identifiable information. This message did not, um, does not indicate a specific person, rather it provides the vaccine event information that can be beneficial if the person has not yet been vaccinated. So those are some of the details about the text messages. Um, as far as people who have um, deep concerns about the vaccine, we know people have questions and concerns about the vaccine. We're asking people to take an action and get an injection. So people may have questions and concerns. That's why we do a lot of work to understand what are the common questions and concerns um, and make sure that's why we have great frequently asked questions. That's why we're working with trusted community partners who can share information, who may be a better messenger than government, as you mentioned at the time. So maybe you wanna find information from one of your church leaders or a different community leader or your school leaders. So that's why we're partnering with them to make sure they have good information about COVID. And also it's really why we encourage people to reach out to their healthcare providers and have that conversation. I think um, this really is about the best protection for individuals, and that is why we want people to have a conversation about that so they can understand the benefits of vaccinations and what the risks are from COVID and what the potential risks are from side effects from the vaccine so they can make a decision for what's best for their own health um, and outside of what um, government is asking them to do. All right, thank you. Did you have, Lacey, did you have anything you wanted to add? All right, Frangie. Um, yeah, I, let me just let me just pick up that last thread. Uh, uh, and thanks for that question. I would just say that, look, we've been doing everything we can for months to to alleviate concerns, to to make things easy, to make them accessible, to work with our private partners, to support our, our local public health partners, our, our tribal vaccine partners, our healthcare partners. We've been doing everything we can to be in the community. We, we've had our caravan launch. We've um, everything on social media, on technology. We've done everything that we can think of. And so, you know, I think at this point, we're really hoping and in some places requiring, depending on the situation that that people do the right thing which is that we have a pandemic but we also have a way to to end this pandemic and unfortunately those who are unvaccinated are contributing to the situation here and that's that's the reality of what we've seen across the country and so you know we here we have vaccines that work they're safe they're effective hundreds of millions of doses have been given across the the country and billions across the globe and we want to make sure that we do everything we can to protect Washingtonians and if you a year ago a year plus ago when things were really dire 
Uh, we, we had uh, people in the state of, uh, in our state and beyond who asked the question, how can we end this pandemic? And we had said at that time, it was through vaccines and all these layered protective measures. And so it is incumbent on all of us. It is our, our responsibility to, to seek out information, not just information on the internet, but to, to get credible information. And so talk to your healthcare provider, do what you can to, to be part of the, 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 the right choice here, which is at the end of the day, we understand freedom, we absolutely respect freedom, but we also respect that we are in the midst of a global pandemic that is not a mild one, it is a severe one. We are now in our fifth wave, our systems are stretched, they're stressed, they're strained. It's due to staff shortages, but it's also because we're seeing a surge. Those are a number of S's, but they all come to, we have to make sure we do what we can to help our system and help all of us once and for all, and hopefully ride this fifth wave down and then not have a sixth or further waves. But unfortunately, if we do not get people vaccinated and people aren't doing the things that they can do to help, then guess what? We are gonna continue in this situation. And I know the vast majority of Washingtonians do not want to see that. So with that, I wanna say thank you to all of you. Please get vaccinated. Please uh, listen to the messages. I wanna thank Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Lindquist. I wanna thank Andy, I wanna thank uh, Michelle, as well as Lacey, and of course, Frangie and all the people that are behind the scenes. I want to say thank you to all of our team members and all those across the, the state that have been working so diligently. And let's do the right thing. Please mask up and please get vaccinated and please help us continue to fight this battle against COVID-19. And with that, Frangie, I'll turn it back to you to close. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. This concludes today's media availability. I'd like to second the thanks to our panelists for their time today and to thank TBW for hosting today's live stream and archives of past briefings. Thank you all and take care.